Hey guys, PK here, and oh my god, I'm drowning in info. Mayday, Mayday, ship's going down. This is gonna split up into parts, just letting you know there's gonna be a lot of info from the new Famitsu article that just dropped, so let's go! Okay, let's talk about crests. Nobles of Bondlin have a crest passed down to them through their bloodline and will be a major crest or a minor crest depending on how potent the blood is. These crests mark a superiority in strength and magic ability. Where have I heard that before? But yeah, it looks like the holy blood from genealogy of the holy war is back in a big way. We'll talk about the gameplay aspects of the crests in a different video. In terms of story, there's a lot to cover. To start off, let's go over that chunk of Fodlin's history that just revealed. Back in the day, the War of Heroes occurred in Fodlin, putting the Church of Saros against Nemesis the Liberation King in order to restore order to the continent. The Adrestian Empire was formed, the Kingdom of Fargus became independent, as did the Leicester Alliance. The three nations fought for supremacy in the continent, but thanks to the Church, the three nations ruled over Fodlin in equilibrium. Alright, there's a big thing here that doesn't add up. Why is Nemesis called the Liberation King rather than something like, oh, I don't know, the Conqueror or the Mad King or something? With that sort of title, it sounds like he was fighting for freedom, like a hero. It sounds as if after the War of Heroes, the history books were written to make Nemesis look like the bad guy and the Church of Saros as the almighty hero of the land who saved Fodlin from destruction. On top of that, Nemesis may not actually be his real name. Him being given the name down the line by the Church would make more sense. He was on the opposite side of the war, after all. In terms of him being called the Liberation King, what exactly was he trying to liberate his people from? The power of the crests? The church's influence? The goddess herself? All three at once? All of those things are interconnected, so that may be the case. In the E3 trailer, it is mentioned that Seros was given a gift from the goddess. One could assume that this gift was the crest of Seros. Later in the trailer, Edelgard says the crests are the tokens of the goddess's power, so it's safe to assume that these crests were given to other individuals, namely the Ten Grace of Foldland, among others. These crests were thought to maintain order within Foldland. These crests probably did not bring order at all. With them becoming basically status symbols for the nobility, this might have caused a division in class or social status within the continent. With the crests being connected to the goddess, the goddess basically has influence over Foldland because of this as well. Was this the sort of thing Nemesis was trying to stop? Speaking of Nemesis, his crest is shown on the back of his cape and his shoulder pauldron. You know who else has that crest? Byleth. You know who else has that crest on their clothing? Sothis. Oh, oh, and, and get this. There's one more place the crest has been seen. A place that we already know about. Webam. Hidden in plain sight. But why? If the Church of Seros wanted to erase the possibility of future generations seeing Nemesis as the good guy, why would his crest be hidden within the design of this mural? Could have there possibly been a defector within the church all those years back when the mural was made? Hard to say for now, but someone definitely wanted that crest to be noticed, but not by the church. One other thing about that crest is its unknown origin. There is a possibility that this crest was not given by the goddess like Seros's crest was. Perhaps it was given by a different divine being. Maybe Sothis? Heck, the Yune Ashera theory may hold some water with this new info. If there were crests given by the goddess, then it would be safe to assume that other divine beings would be able to do the same thing. That would make even more sense if said divine being was part of the goddess who was able to bestow the crests in the first place. So this may have been the other half of that goddess and had given Nemesis his crest which would then be passed down to Byleth. This would justify why Byleth would be able to talk to Sothis in the first place. However, this does raise the question. If Sothis did bestow a crest onto Nemesis back in the day, did she bestow crests onto other people as well? Hard to say for now. So assuming that Byleth is a descendant of Nemesis and has a crest of ugh, why is it that Byleth is classified as a commoner rather than a noble? No other commoner has a crest. Considering that Nemesis is basically painted as an enemy of Foldlin, there is a possibility that Nemesis' descendants had to hide their heritage after the War of Heroes was over in order to protect themselves. Eventually, their heritage was forgotten due to possibly not inheriting their crest anymore and just being in hiding in general for so long. This raises the question of Geralt and Byleth's mother. What of their heritages? There is always the chance that Geralt could have been a descendant of Nemesis and did not inherit the crest, and the same could be said for Byleth's mother. This could result in Byleth having both parents having Nemesis' blood, causing Byleth to have a major crest of bleh. There is also the possibility that Byleth is one of those rare cases where major crests pop up randomly within a bloodline for one reason or another. It could go either way, honestly. There is also the possibility that Geralt knows about Byleth's true heritage and kept it a secret from them, just like how Alm's heritage was kept a secret from him in Echoes. Hell, the Alm parallel could go even further in which Geralt adopted Byleth like how Mycin adopted Alm. 
Speaking of Geralt, he was the leader of the knights back in the day, so him stepping down from the position couldn't have been just because he wanted to. There had to be a major reason for it. If his possible connection to Nemesis was the reason, why would the church accept him back as part of the knights? It wouldn't make sense on their part. If the Grail parallels are a thing, there is a possibility that he, spoilers for people who haven't played the Tellius games, accidentally killed his wife after getting a hold of some malevolent or powerful artifact. An artifact possibly belonging to the church at the time. A possible almighty plot important sword, perhaps? Nah, maybe I'm going way too far with that. Besides, if that was the case, I'd still say it would be weird for the church to accept him back. So yeah, that's still a big ol' question mark. There is one interesting thing to note about the plot important sword that I want to mention, though. The sword depicted in the mural is not the same as this sword. The one in the mural has a curvy, wavy, pointy blade, while the plot important sword has a whippy, bony, spinal cordy blade. We've seen people wielding the plot important sword as mentioned in my first analysis video, which you should totally watch by the way. However, I incorrectly identified the blade Saros was holding. We do, however, see someone else holding a curvy, wavy, pointy blade. This blonde-haired woman from the direct trailer. On top of that, the sword is glowing. Could she be a descendant of Saros? Maybe she even has the major crest of Saros. On that note, let's move on to crests in general. We already know about a handful of them. With Crest of Seiros being associated with Edelgard of the Adrestian Empire, my theory of Dimitri having a close connection with the Church is basically shot. Other than Byleth and Felix, every other noble revealed has a minor crest, including our three main lords. If crests are viewed as a status symbol, why do these kids who have minor crests are next in line for the thrones of each of the respective nations rather than nobles with a major crest? This is more so a mystery with our anomaly Edelgard. On the Foldland map, we can see that the Bladed family and the Regan family have their names marked with their respective crests on the map. However, the Hresleg family name can't be found, and the family with the crest of Saros is the Dravig family? I think that's what it says. We haven't seen any characters of this family yet, so there's no telling if they could be considered a friend or a foe. Y'all better not hurt my waifu. I swear to heck. Another family name that's on the map that we have seen before is the Gautier family. We saw their crest stone equipped as a weapon on the Black Beast towards the end of the direct trailer. This implies that the crests have a stone associated with them and possibly have some sort of great power within them. The Black Beast is probably a construct that came to life because of the crest stone, as seen in the short CGI cutscene later in the trailer. We also see this animatronic woman in the E3 trailer, which we can safely assume is also powered by a crest stone. She does have some sort of crest engraved on her chest, which hints at some sort of connection with them. These crest stones must have been used to power things up that can be used as weapons. We do see a sphere in a cavity of some sort here in the direct trailer. It looks similar to the cavity in the plot of Port and Sword's hilt. Almost every time we see the sword, its cavity is empty. When the sword is in Nemesis's hands, not only is the cavity filled, the sword is also glowing. Perhaps Nemesis was in possession of a crest stone? If so, then what happened to it? It doesn't seem like a crest stone would just fall out of the cavity by accident. The only other time we see the hilt filled is when Seiros is holding it. But it's not glowing or anything. That leads to the possibility of Seros looting the sword from Nemesis' corpse, claiming the sword is her own, and removing the stone from it sometime after acquiring it. Wait. The Church of Seros is built upon lies and slander. The crests are to blame. I will not be silenced! Hey guys, thank you all so much for watching my uh, analysis video. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of info in this new Famitsu article. I'll go over the gameplay stuff that was covered in it um, in another video because, uh, truth be told, I have like about six pages worth of a script for all that, so this definitely needed to be split into two parts. I hope you all watch it when it comes out, and uh, thank you all so much for watching. Um, I don't I think I ran out of recordings for Fire Aria and Menblum, so hopefully I'll get some of those out soon. But other than that, thank you all so much for watching. Click that like button and subscribe button if you want to see more, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye!